ערב טוב וברוכים הבאים לטקס הכרזת זוכי פרס דן דוד לשנת 2018. Welcome to uh, this ceremony. We'll conduct it in English. I'd like to extend a special welcome to the ambassadors of Italy and Great Britain. Uh, my name is Itamar Abinovich. I am the chairman of the Dan David Foundation. On my left is Professor Yosef Klafter, the president of Tel Aviv University and chairman of the board of the Dan David Prize. <clears throat> the internationally renowned Dan David Prize, headquartered at Tel Aviv University, which annually awards three prizes of $1 million US each for outstanding achievement, is proud to announce the laureates for 2018. This prize stands at the forefront of the world's topmost academic prizes. The participation of leading international figures in the Dan David Prize board <coughs> The transparent and accountable selection process and the unique character of the prize, its emphasis on the significance of time and the interplay between time dimensions of the past, present and future, all contribute to its prominence and well standing. The Dan David Prize, founded in 2002 and named after the late Mr. Dan David, international businessman and philanthropist, awards prizes to individuals or institutions with proven exceptional, distinct excellence in the sciences, arts and humanities that have made a remarkable contribution to humankind. Professor Klafter. The laureates for the past time dimension in the field of history of science are Professor Lorraine Duston for her groundbreaking historical work on the ideals and practices of rationality. Fox Keller for her pioneering work in science and gender that has transformed our views of the history of science. Fox Keller has examined particularly particularly the role of language in genetics and molecular biology, interrogating the historical legacy embedded in scientific language. A remarkable insight into the relation between feminism and science reveals the obstacles to the pursuit of science by women and envisions what a gender-free science might look like. And Professor Simon Schaeffer, for the way his work has transformed our understanding of science in history by consistently targeting key issues and probing limits of current debate, spanning a remarkable chronological and geographical range from 17th to 20th century, and from London and Beijing to Parramatta and Paris, Simon Schaeffer's impressive body of work demonstrates how experiment can no longer be seen as the mere testing of theories, but is located in witnessing, trust, and acquired skill. His work exposes how major juncture in history of science are embedded in the localities of commercial exchange, political negotiation, and the activities of everyday life. The laureates for the present time dimension in the field of bioethics are Professor Ezekiel Emanuel for advancing the field of bioethics by combining his skills as a physician policymaker and scholar. 
Professor Emmanuel is a pioneer in the field of end-of-life care and research ethics. He emphasized that patients who want euthanasia of assisted suicide do not do so because of pain, but because of psychological distress, depression, and hopelessness. His analysis of the physician-patient relationship is a landmark widely taught throughout the world and used to educate medical students. Jonathan Glover, for his seminal contribution to the theoretical aspects of bioethics, for setting the research agenda in many topics, in particular in human enhancement and reproductive ethics. His original research spans diverse topics such as human nature, war and the Holocaust, genetic ethics, neuroethics, and psychiatric issues. The originality of his thought is marked by the role he plays in shaping the debates others will follow. And Baroness Mary Warnock, for her heading for her leading role in the development of practical bioethics and specifically for her progressive and unparalleled contribution to the ethics of embryology and genetics and their ethical and philosophical implication, reproductive technologies and disability studies. Dame Mary helped enhance the welfare of society by breaking the boundaries between academic and enacted ethics. <laughs> the laureate of the future time dimension in the field of personalized medicine are Professor Carlo Croce, for pioneering the unraveling of the molecular basis of a number of lymphoma and leukemia cancers. Mastering both cytogenetics and molecular biology, he identified the role of major oncogenes as drivers of cancer development, progressing, progressing and resistance to therapy. His studies also demonstrated the role of microRNAs in tumor pathogenesis. His numerous findings in cancer enabled precise cancer diagnosis, individualized targeting of therapy, and development of novel, rationally designed anti-cancer drugs. Professor Mary Claire King, for being a world leader in medical genetics, with major contributions to the study of molecular basis of several diseases. Her seminal findings, finding was the demonstration of a genetic predisposition to breast and ovarian cancer, resulting from the mutation of a single gene, the BRCA1 gene. This game-changing discovery contributes to the understanding of hereditary cancer predisposition and revolutionized clinical approaches for cancer predeposition screening, individualized interventions and tailoring of rational therapy. And Professor Bert Fogelstein for his seminal contributions to the understanding of cancer, genetics and genomics. His pioneering studies on colon cancer demonstrated that cancer results from sequential genetic and epigenetic alterations. He was involved in the identification and characterization of tumor suppressor genes and oncogenes and developed and applied high throughput methodologies for concomitant analysis of thousands of genes and whole genomes. Such approaches paved the road to early diagnosis, precise characterization, and tailoring of individualized therapy of cancer. Thank you, Professor Klafter. The laureates will be honored at the festive Dan David Prize Award Ceremony 
which will take place on May 6, 2018, at Tel Aviv University, in the presence of distinguished guests from all over the world. In addition, the laureates will participate in an array of associated events, academic symposia, a scholarship award ceremony, a youth essay competition, and you are cordially invited to attend all of these. We will now be treated to two relatively brief uh, presentations by Tel Aviv faculty members uh, relevant to, uh, to the fields of uh, two of the prizes. Uh, the first is uh, Professor Tal Dvir, which I'm delighted to invite. He's from a, a member of the faculty of uh, George S. Wise Faculty of Life Sciences, and he will be discussing Engineering Tissues and Organs from Patient-Specific to Bionic Organs. Professor Dvir, please. Okay, so it's a great honor to be here uh, and present the work that we're doing at the lab. Uh, the lab is at the Department of Biotechnology and the Department of uh, Material Science and Engineering. And we're working on tissue engineering. We're engineering different types of tissues from the brain, uh, spinal cord, heart, eyes, uh, and other organs. I will mainly focus on the heart and uh, show you a little bit, uh, a few things about uh, spinal cord. Um, and I'll tell you how uh, we can engineer tissues, uh, personalize tissues, and how we can create even organs with enhanced uh, uh, capabilities. So uh, if we're talking about uh, uh, the heart, uh, let's uh, talk a minute about the uh, disease that we're trying to cure. Um, heart disease is still the number one cause of death in the Western world, more than all types of cancers together. And myocardial infarction or heart attack captures a significant fracture of these diseases. And it happens when a major blood vessel that nourishes the left ventricle is blocked. As a consequence, uh, blood, oxygen, nutrients are deprived from the ventricle. Uh, the cardiomyocytes, cardiac muscle cells, uh, simply die if they don't get oxygen. And there is a, a scar tissue is formed. This, uh, the tissue cannot contract, cannot send pulses of blood to the rest of the uh, body. And the poor statistic says that 50% of the people who've had their first severe heart attack will die within five years. Currently, the only solution for the end-stage patient is uh, heart transplantation. And since we all know that there's shortage in donors, there's a need to find new approaches to repopulate this area with cells that are capable of contraction. And if we simply take cells and inject them to this area, most of them, more than 95% of the cells simply die. They cannot form cell-cell and cell-matrix interactions, and they simply die. What we do in the lab, we're trying to bring to this area not uh, isolated cells, but the whole tissue. Uh, and this is the basis for the tissue engineering uh, approach. And how does it uh, work? We have a patient, as you can see here, with a this is the organ on its uh, left side here. What we're doing in the lab, we're creating an equivalent tissue that has the same functionality. Then we can remove the defected uh, tissue and, of course, under sterile conditions, as you can see here, uh, we can transplant the uh, uh, engineered tissue on the defected organ. And how does it really work? What do we do? We can take cells from the patient uh, or from other sources. We can cultivate the cells initially in uh, uh, petri dishes, and then we need to create uh, a tissue from the cells. And tissues in the body are not just cells. There are cells and the glue in between them, the extracellular matrix. And what we're doing in the lab, we're developing different types of biomaterials that can mimic this extracellular matrix. We see the cells inside these biomaterials, we can add different uh, type of, uh, types of uh, growth factors, small molecules, nanoparticles, and essentially we're doing everything we can to allow these cells to assemble into a functioning tissue, which will be then taken and transplanted instead of the defected tissue. So when we're talking about cardiac patches, uh, we call them patches because they are used to patch the heart, um, we can create them with different types of uh, cells. We can use adult cells or different types of uh, stem cells. 
Currently, what we're doing in the lab, we're uh, using induced pluripotent stem cells. These are cells that can be taken from any organ, for example, from the skin of the patient. We reprogram these cells to become stem cells, and stem, uh, stem cells have the capability of uh, differentiating uh, to any cell type. And this is what we're doing in the lab. We're differentiating these cells uh, to cardiac cells, neuronal cells, endothelial cells, whatever we want. Then we see the cells in the biomaterials, and we've already shown that these uh, cardiac patches, when transplanted <coughs> on, the, on the infarcted heart, can significantly improve heart uh, function. This is how a typical cardiac patch at the lab uh, uh, looks like. You can see this is a few centimeters in diameter, a few millimeters in uh, thickness, and it contracts nicely in the lab for a long period of time without, uh, 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 without stopping, without external stimulation. However, if we take these cardiac patches and transplant them, we see nice regeneration after a month or two. However, if we wait enough, we see also a nice rejection because uh, these patches are made from uh, uh, synthetic materials or even from materials that are natural, but uh, uh, they're not recognized by the body. Uh, they're not personalized. So we decided uh, to have uh, this concept where we can take fatty tissue from a patient, remove the cells from this uh, fatty tissue, uh, reprogram these cells to become stem cells and differentiate them to whatever we want. And the extracellular matrix, the biomaterial in between the cells, is serving us now as a scaffold for the cells. So we create a completely autologous uh, cardiac patch in this case that will not provoke an immune response. So if we're uh, looking at the, the biomaterial, it looks like this. Uh, you can see these are mainly collagen uh, fibers. Cardiac cells really like these uh, materials. They assemble nicely into a functioning tissue. And we can also create blood vessel networks inside these uh, uh, patches because without the blood vessels, the patch will die after transplantation. So we can take these patches and transplant them on the infarcted heart. You can see here the uh, heart uh, beats and the patch on top of it. Um, and you can see a few things. One of the things here is that we need to perform an open chest surgery. And we thought maybe we can do something better. Maybe we can find an, a more elegant way to introduce these cardiac patches to the heart without opening the chest. And we took the biomaterials from the patient. We manipulated them a, a little bit. Uh, we developed a way that these uh, uh, materials are liquid in room temperature. You can mix the cells here. And when uh, they are heated up to 37 degrees, the body temperature, they solidify, as you can see here. So now we can bring these uh, uh, patches directly to the heart with a catheter. Uh, without really uh, uh, forming uh, an open chest surgery. So what can we do with this uh, technology? So we can take this uh, fatty tissue, remove the cells, uh, create these induced pluripotent stem cells, create the hydrogel from the extracellular matrix, mix them together, and we, in the lab we're creating different types of personalized patches, for example, uh, with adipocytes for reconstructive uh, surgeries, uh, for, uh, we can create motor uh, and cortical uh, uh, neuronal patches, cardiac patches, endothelial cells for uh, blood vessels. And we can even create or use more advanced technologies such as uh, 3D printing or microfluidics to create more complicated uh, tissues. So here you can see the different types of cells and these cells came from the same cell, from this fatty, uh, from this fat cell now created cardiac cells, endothelial cells, different types of neurons, uh, adipocytes, again, everything from the patient. And here you can see a typical cardiac patch that contracts. This is really uh, uh, big, uh, uh, big dimensions. We already taken this approach and uh, uh, injected these uh, materials to uh, the left ventricle of pigs, which is a, a, a step before going to uh, clinical uh, trials. So I promise that we can also uh, that we can also uh, 3D print uh, tissues in a, a personalized manner. So what we do here, we look at CT images of the patient, we look at the left ventricle, 
we see these uh, blood vessels and we create the same scheme on the computer. Now we go to our uh, uh, 3D printer in the lab. Uh, this is the model and we're just printing the hydrogel, the patient specific hydrogel with the patient specific cells and creating a patient specific vascularized cardiac patch with the nice blood vessels that can be transplanted uh, on the infarcted heart without provoking an immune response. And this is uh, extremely important. This is how a cardiac patch, a printed cardiac patch uh, looks like. We can manipulate it and fuse it with uh, uh, dyes and transplant it. And uh, if we look at the blood vessels, this is a cross section of one blood vessel. You can see that it's open and blood can really flow uh, inside. We can even, even do more complicated things, for example, print whole hearts. And this is something that we're working on now in the lab. And this is a tiny heart, a rat-sized uh, heart that was printed in the lab, and we're now uh, transplanting it in, uh, in rats. So this is uh, 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 about the heart. I'll tell you a few words about spinal cord yeah. implants, and then we'll move on uh, to the heart uh, uh, for another project on the heart. So spinal cord implants, you know, spinal cord injuries, there's nothing to do. Uh, what we do, we create these uh, 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 implants with uh, motor neurons, as you can see here. And what we're doing, we're transplanting them, injecting them to the, uh, uh, to the scar tissue of uh, animals. And now I will show you two movies. Uh, we have several control groups. I'm just showing uh, uh, two groups, the untreated. You will see now the animal is uh, walking. You can see that one of the legs is pulled. Uh, the animal cannot walk on the leg. And you can see here that this, this is the leg that is uh, pulled. Uh, the animal is not really uh, pressing. And now I'll show you the movie. After two weeks uh, from transplantation, this is the animal that walks really nicely. We have tens of animals like uh, this, that, uh, uh, and we kept them for uh, uh, more than six months already. And uh, so now we're switching back to the uh, heart. Another problem that we have with the uh, heart patches or with the uh, cardiac tissues is the uh, electrical uh, or the transfer of the electrical signal. Uh, we're using different types of biomaterials, but the biomaterials are not conducting and cardiac cells, uh, they need to transfer an electrical signal uh, in order for them to contract nicely. Um, so the cells organize in the biomaterial and these cells contract and these contract, but they're not really speaking with each other on the electrical level. And what we've decided to do was uh, to uh, uh, incorporate gold nanowires, conducting materials, uh, into these uh, biomaterials and to help the cells uh, to really transfer the electrical signals uh, in between them. Um, we did a lot of work on this uh, uh, um, gold nanoparticle uh, patches. Here you can see a patch without gold nanoparticles. We stimulated this area and we want to see how it propagates uh, the electrical signal. You can see by the illumination that nothing is really synchronized with the gold nanoparticles. I hope that you can see it. Everything is contracting together um, just because, uh, uh, because of these uh, particles. We already took the uh, personalized materials. We incorporated gold nanoparticles to them as well. And we basically took a biological material that comes from the patient and we created a fully conducting material from it, but it has also the biological motives in it. So these are electrogenic cells, uh, cardiomyocytes. Other cells that are electrogenic are uh, neurons. So we can do uh, these things as well. We can create these uh, fibers with gold nanoparticles. And when we grow neurons, you can see the differences. This is without gold. You can see that the axons are not really uh, matured. And you can see elongated axons with the gold nanoparticles. And this is extremely important when we're talking about regenerating uh, the brain or spinal cord or other organs. We're also working on uh, Parkinson. Uh, we create uh, uh, droplets of uh, tissues with uh, dopaminergic uh, cells. And again, everything comes from the same fatty tissue of the patient. And you can see that these are active uh, uh, implants that actually release uh, dopamine. And we're now uh, uh, collaborating with uh, Danny Offen here at the uh, university to regenerate uh, dopaminergic or, or Parkinsonian uh, uh, brains. 
The last project that uh, I'm going to talk about is uh, what we call cyborg tissues, the integration of electronics, nanoelectronics with the uh, engineered tissues. And not just because it's a cool project to incorporate or integrate these uh, uh, electronics with living uh, um, uh, uh, cells, because we really needed to see if the cells are functional, if the cells contract, if they contract synchronously. So we developed a way to create uh, thin layers of uh, nanoelectronics with the field effect transistors. We incorporated these transistors to the uh, biomaterial serving as a scaffold. So we have a scaffold, three-dimensional scaffold with many, many tiny sensors within. Once we culture cardiac cells, uh, as you can see here, we can online see the function of the tissue, and this is just one electrode. We have many, many electrodes, so many, many sensors within. So we can see the function of these uh, uh, tissues. We can add drugs and immediately see on our computer uh, the effect of these drugs on the, uh, on the tissue. So it was a really uh, cool project, really cool publication. Um, we were very proud, but it wasn't enough for us. Because in this case, we could only sense the function of the tissue, but we couldn't interfere, something was wrong. So the next thing that uh, uh, we did was to incorporate another system. In addition to the sensing, we added a system that allows us to stimulate the cells. Just type on the computer and stimulate the cells and provide electrical uh, propagation inside the tissue. In addition, we added another uh, property that allows us to release different types of drugs just by typing on the computer. So if you think about the uh, technology, the patient is sitting in his house, he's not feeling well, obviously there's something wrong with the patient's heart, uh, and the physician gets a beeper, uh, get a notification saying that he should log on to the computer and start to activate or regenerate uh, uh, this, uh, uh, the heart from afar. Uh, so he can release different types of uh, factors, for example, dexamethasone if he uh, uh, senses that there is uh, inflammation, um, factors that promoting blood vessel formation if uh, uh, it senses that there is no, not enough oxygen, and these are things that we've already done uh, at the lab. And if you really think about it, we don't even need a physician because we, we know how to write uh, simple codes and uh, the cardiac patch now regulates its own uh, uh, function. So the next uh, step, and this is something that we, we already do at the lab, is creating whole hearts with uh, electronics, so we call it a bionic, uh, a bionic heart. And with that, uh, I would like to uh, end up and acknowledge uh, my group members, my collaborators, and my uh, funding. So we're uh, working on that just now, preparing uh, uh, for the first clinical trials. We're uh, um, we're finding a, a company that uh, uh, that will do that, and. Uh, uh, hopefully, in a couple of years, we, all, we will already have uh, uh, humans with these uh, patches. Good evening, everyone. It is a special honor and great privilege to be here this evening uh, to congratulate uh, all nine laureates, but especially the three in my field, Professor Ezekiel Emanuel, Professor Jonathan Glover, and Baroness uh, Mary Warnock. Each of these three prize winners, uh, in his or her own way, are pioneers in the field of bioethics, setting the grounds for others to follow, contributing to a deeper understanding of bioethical questions and advancing human society.
Their contributions are very diverse. But if asked to choose one topic that has been a shared concern for each of them, one would say the question of the beginning and end of life, and specifically the important question of when does life begin and end. And it is to this topic that my talk on the paradoxes of Jewish bioethics in Israel is devoted. Advancements in medical technology have given us ever greater control over the way we give birth and die with the assistance of reproductive technologies and life-sustaining machinery. But, importantly, they have also blurred our understanding of when life begins and when life ends. What was once a simple question, or a relatively simple question, of natural birth and natural death has become a riddled question with the growing use of artificial reproductive technologies and artificial life-sustaining technologies. Does life begin at conception or at birth or sometime somewhere along the way? Should the life of a two-week-old embryo, say, in a Petri dish, be protected as a certain form of human life? Similar questions arise at the end of life. Is the removal of life-sustaining treatment, such as a mechanical ventilator, a causing death? When does death happen? Brain death? Heart death? Science has much to teach us about life and living organisms, but cannot offer definitive answers on the ethical question of when human life begins and when it ends. The question of beginning and end of human life is not a scientific question, or, and this will be important for my talk, not only a scientific question. It is also an ethical question. Some uh, scholars and some people would have the question answered as a scientific question, simply. Others would say it has nothing to do with science and everything to do with ethics, and I believe that the real question is how to align, how to bring into alignment science and ethics. But here is where the question becomes thorny. When it comes to science, we can reach agreement, if not on uh, answers, at least on methods of inquiry. Uh, when it comes to ethics, we accept the fact of human diversity, so there is no American, Russian science dif different from each other. Uh, but we accept as given that there can be a Christian, a Muslim, or a Buddhist ethics. It is in this context that we may also speak of Israeli bioethics, or rather uh, Jewish bioethics in Israel. So along with several colleagues, I have uh, recently uh, edited a, a book on the question of bioethics and biopolitics in Israel, uh, a few insights from which I would like to share with you. Um, Israeli bioethics, as it turns out, has drawn the attention of a wide international community of scholars. It is a common assumption among scholars in the field that Israeli bioethics is exceptional, especially when it comes to questions of reproductive technology. And it is exceptional because it is quite lenient in the use of uh, reproductive uh, technologies, a point which I will demonstrate shortly. In contrast to these arguments, the book, and especially my uh, talk, very short talk today, wants to counter-argue and say that Israeli bioethics is not so exceptional. It, it's interesting, it's distinct, but it's not so uh, exceptional. And what it allows us to see, perhaps, and this is an important point, are things that happen in other ethical systems, but we see them more clearly when we look at Israeli uh, and Jewish bioethics. Or to put it the way I believe Lionel Blue put it, Jews are just like everyone else, only more so. Um, so, uh, 
I would like also to challenge the argument that Israeli bioethics is very progressive and advanced. Perhaps it is progressive and advanced, but this is only because it also lies on quite conservative grounds, and hence what I would like to call the paradox of Israeli bioethics. It's the, a conservative aspect of Israeli Jewish bioethics that leads it at times to be quite progressive or at least creative. So let me say a few words about what I think uh, many of you know uh, about Israeli, so to speak, exceptional bioethics, especially, again, in the field of reproductive technologies. So take, for example, genetic testing. Over 80% of Israeli women undergo at least one genetic test during their first pregnancy. IVF treatment in Israel, this I do not need to tell you, you've read yesterday's paper, is extremely uh, uh, advanced. Now, uh, just in recent years, a growth of 10 times in freezing uh, ova uh, for reproductive ends, but the number of IVF procedures in Israel is tenfold time than in the UK, for example. And then stem cell research, is Israel uh, has been in recent years uh, an empire in the field of stem cell research. We export, paradoxically somewhat, uh, stem cell lines to Germany where this, the production of these lines has been uh, prohibited. Uh, abortion, Israel is not, doesn't have high rates of abortion, but it has a special system of allowing abortion, at least in the law, until the very last uh, trimester of the pregnancy, which is quite unusual in Western society. So these are some of the aspects, I think, that have drawn the attention of uh, uh, scholars in the, in the field. On the end of life, on the other hand, um, Israel is also somewhat exceptional in the Western world in the sense that we are very actually conservative in the uh, allowing withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment. In Israel, uh, once you're hooked to a life-sustaining machine, if it's a continuous uh, machine uh, activating machine, then you cannot be uh, withdrawn from that uh, machine. So if uh, asked what are the reasons for this, I'm sure if we had the time, you would say, uh, obviously, these things make sense. It's about sanctity of life and the importance given to sanctity of life on both, on both ends. Uh, this may be the case, but I think that among many and many Christian uh, societies, there's also an emphasis on uh, sanctity of life, and that doesn't necessarily lead to this kind of use of reproductive uh, technologies or to the way we treat abortion, which seems somewhat paradoxical. Pronatality is another reason that people give in this context. Obviously, Israel is a pronatal society. This has to do with the long Jewish culture, but also with the recent history of the Holocaust and perhaps also with demography and contemporary politics. But again, not everything can be explained from this lens, for example, the question of abortion. So let me say a few words about uh, a different take, not contradictory, not to um, refute the basic line in the literature, but to add to it. Um, first of all, Israeli bioethics is exceptional only when compared to North American and Central European bioethics. When put in a different context, say the context of the Middle East, Israeli bioethics is by no means uh, exceptional and not necessarily because it's a, in some ways uh, not progressive. Uh, if you look at stem cell, the map of stem cells and the treatment of stem cells, uh, Israel and Iran are two leading uh, countries in the, in the region. Uh, uh, on end of life, we have similar uh, problems facing similar challenges as in uh, Egypt. Uh, but more importantly, I think, than the question of exceptionalism is the way in which Israel is, in fact, in some ways, innovative. But innovative not necessarily in the sense that it's lenient in the use of technologies, but I think more in the creative way in which, and we go back to the question of the alignment of ethics and science. And I think this is key in understanding the, what can be seen, again, I don't think as exceptionality, but a certain creativeness of Israeli bioethics. So let me give uh, two examples that are also relevant to some of the work of, uh, by the laureates of the Dan uh, David Prize. Um, let's give one example on each side, at each end of life. So starting with uh, the question of 
that. So uh, Israel is quite creative in this way. In Israel, Israel is the only country in the world that I know of where you can decide when you die. That is, when you can decide what is a criterion for being dead. So you can get to choose whether you die according to a brain death uh, definition of uh, dying, or if you refuse, reject the brain death definition of dying, then you can uh, die according to the old traditional heart definition. More interestingly is the way in which the Israeli legislator has defined the definition of brain death. It has not, the, the Israeli law is very interesting because it's called the respiratory brain death, which is a, a oxymoron in most, uh, in most uh, countries because it combines the old definition of respiration and the new definition of brain death. And it's a very creative um, combination uh, that you can imagine was uh, devised in order to satisfy a traditional understanding of respiration and a modern understanding of brain death. And the argument is that the brain death is not the real criteria, it's just a proxy for the question for determining respiration, which is the real foundational uh, definition. So whereas in other countries, say, let's take the United States, in 1967 the ad hoc Harvard committee uh, sat down and decided that scientific advancements have led to move the definition of death from the heart to the brain. This definition was immediately accepted and the science was easily naturalized into questions of ethics. Whereas in Israel this process is not, is not over yet and what the legislature has done is now being undone by certain uh, religious communities. But you can see how the process of trying to align uh, science and ethics is problematic everywhere, but in Israel you see it very, very clearly. Another example at the beginning of, uh, of, of life. The reason why is Israel is on many questions of reproductive technology appears to be so lenient is because it actually adopts a quite conservative understanding of when life begins. Uh, most Western countries, to varying degrees, uh, incorporate a scientific understanding, a contemporary, modern scientific understanding of when life begins, either in this idea that uh, a fertilized egg in a petri dish can signify the beginning of life, right? So even though this, is, this uh, vision is adopted by Christian fundamentalists, it's actually based on a modern sense of when life uh, begins, or by using, uh, when we talk about fetuses, a certain notion of the viability of the fetus, which also includes a certain kind of technology that allows us to keep the fetus viable. Whereas under Jewish uh, law, Jewish tradition that has influenced also Israeli law, uh, the embryo or the fetus are not considered to be human uh, life until the 40th day, this is the tradition, and then until birth there's a different, a different stage. But basically Israel allows a quite lenient uh, relationship to life because it is based on a quite uh, traditionalist point uh, of view. So um, there's much more that could be said about this, but let me uh, conclude with an anecdote that I hope will capture some of what I've been uh, trying to say to you this evening. The anecdote goes back to uh, a dinner conversation at Oxford University at All Souls College, where every uh, week they would bring in guests. And this evening that we're discussing, the, there were two guests. One was a scientist, a biologist, and another was uh, a clergy, a bishop. And the argument, or the discussion that was taking place, was whether science will be able to create a human being. And obviously, the scientist said that it, would on, it was only a matter of time until science will be able to reach the level in which we can create a human being in the lab. And the bishop obviously said that this will never happen because human beings are created in the image of God and only God uh, can create human beings through the matchmaking of a man and a woman. And the discussion went back and forth and very heated. At a certain point, David Dabu, David Dalby, uh, a scholar of ancient law, who was sitting at the end of the table, intervened and said to the scientists, let me concede that science one day will be able to create a human being, but will it be able to create a Jew? <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, Professor Lavi returned to his seat, but if there is a question or a couple of questions addressed to him, we'll take that. Okay, so that takes us not to the end of life, but to the end of event. Uh, brings, uh, the, the, today's event is, is concluded. Uh, the festivities begin again on May 6, and there'll be quite a few other events on, on, that, on that week, and you all, as I said, cordially invited. Thank you for coming.